thank you, Dan. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and really thank you for inviting me and for organizing this uh, wonderful event. Um, so uh, I want to, to, to try to, to be the, you know, uh, as you say in Hebrew, Ibcha Mistabra, to, to be the devil's advocate and really go in the opposite direction to what most of the talks I had so far were. So essentially, I think there was almost consensus here so far that we really need to understand all the microbiological details in order, in order to understand what makes us human. And uh, so, so I want to tell you about a story that uh, I've been involved in, in the research of uh, neural networks since the 80s, but uh, recently, I mean, the, the effect that, uh, the fact that deep learning becomes so important and so successful uh, is really uh, shedding some very interesting light on, on the question that we are interested in and what, what makes us human. And I actually want to be even more ambitious and start from the question, what is intelligence? Or if you want even, what is life? Uh, the red, so this is really what I call a top-down approach. I mean, I, I, I want to think on the problem from above instead of from the details. You had a lot of talks about the details. And I think that the consensus is so far that the details really don't explain what makes us human. In some sense, we are just an elevated chimpanzee, and uh, we have exactly the same type of brain, exactly the same type of cells, a little larger, uh, a little denser, uh, and so on. But I'm, I'm looking for something very dramatic for a phase transition, I mean, something which will really explain why we are so different, not why we are so similar to the monkeys. And in order to understand this, I, I, I really want to think from above. I mean, so if I have to define intelligence, I mean, biology, as far as I'm concerned, didn't develop a theory in the sense that they cannot really tell us, tell us very little, almost nothing, about life elsewhere. I mean, should it be based on the same chemistry? Uh, should it look like us? I mean, what is really in common to all intelligence beings, including devices that are based on silicon, not on, not on cells, on, on neurons. And, and the, it's not entirely my position, but I take this extreme position now. Uh, so intelligence, as far as I'm concerned, has to do with something very simple, and if you think about it, it's a better definition of life and intelligence than what we usually hear from biologists. So if you hear biologists, you ask biologists what is life, they tell you, everything about metabolic exchange of matter with the environment and about reproduction and about other things which are certainly very important for life, but is this essential? So there is one thing which I believe is really essential for intelligent behavior, and this is making valuable predictions. And, and what, it, it came up already in several talks, uh, but not, not in its clearest way. So essentially, I actually argue that what separates out for innate things, for, for non-living and non-intelligent things, is the ability to exploit information from the past and use it in the future in a valuable way. And, and if you think, let's say, about the lion and the deer in this picture, the existence depends strongly on the ability to predict what's going to happen a few seconds, maybe several seconds ahead. And if you think about more complicated animals and consciousness or whatever, they usually differ from each other mainly, and I'm going to come back to this, by how far into the future they can plan and predict. And I actually argue that I'm thinking about this particular phenomenon of making predictions. Uh, we actually discover this phase transition that separates us from everything else. <laughs> this really makes us unique. And uh, so this making prediction, first of all, I mean, it, usually we, we like to say that the future cannot be predicted. Uh, this is complete nonsense, of course. Most of the time, all of us are making valuable predictions. I know that I'm going to sit here, I knew, uh, to talk here, I knew it uh, in advance a month ago or a year ago, and uh, although there were some bumps on the way, and <laughs> I, I knew that I'm, I know that you are going to sit here, and I even can predict that you'll sit here in the next 10 minutes or even half an hour. So there are many, many things that we can predict. Actually. Most of our behavior, most of the things around us are very predictable. What we can predict is, of course, the unpredictable. But that's a tautology, you know. So, in some sense, 
our existence depends on the fact that the environment is stable enough to make predictions. And what I argue, and this is just you know, a glimpse of a very big story, is that our brain is largely, more, more than anything else, a prediction machine. And if you think about it, not in terms of hemispheres, as, the, as we heard many, many times this week, but actually in terms of function. So re real, the, the real partition of the brain is not between right and left, but between front and dorsal. I mean, front and dorsal are the front part of the, the cortex of the brain in general, and the back part of the cortex. And this is really a very sharp separation. The back part of our brain is responsible for what we call sensory perception. I mean, receiving information from the environment. And the front part of our brain is about decision-making, planning, thinking about the future. And really, one of the most striking differences between us and our closest relatives, like the chimpanzees, is the size of the frontal cortex, which is really how, essentially reflecting how much planning, or how much thinking ahead we do. Now, this, what is nice about this philosophy, this idea of valuable predictions, or as, as we usually call it, a perception action cycle, or the information flow between us and the environment, is something which I can mathematically formulate very clearly. So essentially what I think, and then it's following the work of many other people, for example, Fuster and others, that it is what characterizes us is the flow of information in the technical sense of information between us and the world around us. And, and, and so essentially in our sensory perception, whether it's vision or audition or whatever it is, we receive a lot of information and eventually we extract very little out of it, which is exactly what we need in order to behave efficiently in the future. So the main task of the brain, I think that many here will agree with this, is being able to squeeze out the irrelevant details which are not necessary for the future and eventually use only one, those very few bits that you need in order, in order to walk, in order to talk, in order to make decisions, in order to make plans. This is true for any animal, by the way, any organism, even single cell organism, or even, you, may, you may even argue that viruses to some extent have and sensor, senses or sensory perception in some sense and behavior. And once you have these two things, you receive information and you process it and eventually use it, you're already a, a, a living organism. You're acting against the tendency of innate things to go to maximum disorder and, and completely being predictable. So of course there are all sorts of philosophical questions here, but if you think about this, about our brain and actually look at the division of the functionality of this condition, you see this is actually a hierarchy. It's not one scale. There are many, many time scales of predictions. Actually, my sensory motor right next in the center of the cortex, or actually in the subcortical areas, when I touch this table here, I immediately close within half a second a loop of muscles that act with respect to this, to this pressure that I got from the table. When I talk to you, I actually make a much longer cycle on the order of seconds and minutes. And when I plan this talk, I think about hours. And when I plan my sabbatical next year, I, I think about years and so on. So we have some unique capability of thinking about multiple time scales. And our brain actually reflects it. I mean, if you look at different parts of the cortex, you see that close to this, uh, to this rifty floor, the, the, the partition between the sensory and motor Parts, it's red and blue. Uh, there's a very sharp partition in time. This is usually short time scales, and when it gets further away, we see longer and longer loops. And the question is uh, how are these loops formed and what really separates them? Now, in my, the nice thing about this very simple minded approach is that I really don't care about the hardware at this point, whether it's done by neurons or by transistors or by photons doesn't matter. The question is whether this machine is capable of somehow do this prediction of the future from the observed fast to this perception channel and use it in a valuable way in the future. Okay, so, and, and, and the real beauty of it, the real beauty of it is this is tractable mathematically. And I really believe that mathematics is the guiding line for everything. So if we, if we can actually analyze it using very simple mathematics, we have maybe a chance of actually understanding what's going on. 
Now, of course, the idea of uh, artificial intelligence goes all the way, in my opinion, to two people, Turing and Shannon. They were not mentioned enough, but together they really gave us this understanding of these two aspects of information, information processing or computation, and information transfer, transfer of communication, which is, and we know mathematically, in a very crisp way, how these things interact. I mean, how information is quantified and how information is processed. Now, as a, surprisingly, I mean, we can really track down what we call the information age to these two people in the 40s, 40s or early 50s, and it's also the idea of artificial intelligence, which both of them were actually interested in. And surprisingly, actually, both of them already think, thought about, Turing certainly, about mimicking biology. And what we do today is we take these neurons that we heard so much about, and if you think about the essence, what is really so special about the neuron, again, in my humble opinion, it's not the biochemistry and not what type of molecules go where, but the fact that they interact with each other through those synapses in a way which is not necessary for any metabolic reason, but for one thing, accumulating information. And in the language of information, I actually know that synapses are formed in order to enhance the predictive power of the whole brain. And it's done through this law that you heard about, the synaptic time-dependent plasticity, which really enhances predictability. I don't want to get into it in Toronto. But what is really nice about neurons is that we can actually mimic them mathematically in a very simple way. Through this very simple gate, the synapses are mapped into these weights, so these uh, uh, synaptic efficacies, which are essentially how strong a neuron is connected to another neuron, and if another neuron is these x variables, essentially this very simplistic view of a neuron, the Michalopitz neuron, take the dot product of these weights with the synaptic inputs and take some nonlinearity like a sine or like a sigmoidal function or like any other smooth, long, smooth or not smooth nonlinearity, which is helping us in some sense. And this is really the basis of what we call today neural networks. And neural networks, they're just stacking these mechalopist neurons in, in rows such that they communicate with each other because one neuron is doing something very simple. It's just a hyperplane through the data, and hyperplanes are limited. They're not, we cannot do much with a hyperplane only. But once we put several, it's enough actually one hidden layer like this, we immediately can implement very rich class of functions. And this was the state of the art of of neural networks uh, in the 80s mainly, when we, talk, we thought about very few neurons like this, and we already knew that in principle, these are universal machines. In practice, we also knew that training a very shallow network to do a very general function requires very wide hidden layer and essentially exponential number of points to train them. So what happened since then was actually quite striking. I want to, to go through it essentially. AI uh, had a lot of failures. I really want to run through it because I'm sure other will. The big surprise was that when we stack these neurons in many, many layers, and this happens in the, in the 2000s, I mean, after the, the dark age of AI in the 90s, where everything was dominated by support vector machines and kernel machines, eventually, uh, in the 2000s, uh, Hinton and others, uh, uh, Lacoon and few others, showed us that with this stack, stacking many neurons together, many layers together, you can actually do surprisingly good job, amazingly good job in object recognition and later on and later in, in speech recognition and in control and in robotics and even very hard problems like protein folding or like uh, uh, problems are not, we, we are not even capable of tackling at all uh, seem to be doing well with such models. And so this was uh, essentially bringing the machine, I mean artificial intelligence from the logic state to the statistical state and then now to the deep learning phase, and the deep learning phase seems to be so successful that we really don't understand what's going on. And uh, when you think about it, machine learning until deep learning was essentially just fancy curve fitting. Curve fitting is something which was invented by Gauss. Essentially put a line through data in a, in a smooth way more or less, and we know now that the main issue is what we call generalization. I, I don't want to fit my data point. I want to fit out of my data point. And therefore, if I put a very complicated function, like a very complicated polynomial through my data, I'm going to overfit, which means I'm going to fit my data very well, but I'm going to completely miss point, new points. 
So we are essentially most of the machine learning is about how to regularize this overfitting in a clever way. And now how to choose the class of functions. In this case, for example, a sine function looks like a much better choice than a polynomial and so on. So uh, choosing the class, the, what you call the positive class, and avoiding overfitting is essentially all of deep learning. There's nothing more than that. But then deep learning, I mean, with this stacking neurons came in, and essentially something surprising happened. With deep learning, and this is a very schematic plot, rather than having a saturation of the performance with the data, the performance of these very big networks, which has millions of parameters, many, many millions of parameters, so the whole idea of overfitting, I mean, a fit parameter or curve fitting, which essentially is based on the law that the number of points should be proportional or close to the number of parameters, is completely gone. And we are talking now about hundreds of millions or billions of parameters and only hundreds of thousands of examples. So the whole notion of parameter fitting is wrong. And it's not the way we should think about it. Something completely different happened to the parameters of, of, of deep learning. And now I'm talking about the artificial machines. I'll come back to the brain later on and why it's so important for the brain. But those very complex machines seem to improve with data in a way which is very surprising. When we give it more data and it does better, it doesn't saturate as finite parametric models. This is very rough, of course, there are many details here. So what's going on? So we know that there's some sort of information processing of uh, transformations between those layers. The representation of the data is changing from layer to layer in a very interesting way. And I actually want to understand, among many others, I don't want to think about it as a black box. Black boxes I live from magicians. I want, I want really to know what's going on. And in order to know what's going on, you need some sort of a theory, as was said already several times in this meeting. Now, a theory means I need some basic, simple mathematics with very few variables that can actually describe the complexity of these transformations from one point to the other. So the way we think about it, I mean, this is me and, and together with two of my students who are sitting here somewhere, Noga Zaslavsky and, uh, and Ravid Schwarzziv and, and several others who are joining us, we think about the neural network First of all, we do several radical changes. We don't think about neurons anymore. I think about the whole layer as one variable. So if the input is x, let's say pixels of an image, this can be 10, billion, 10 million bits of pixels, uh, and, and, and y is the desired label, which can be just one bit. Is it me or not me, or something like this? The layers, which I call here age, and later we'll call t, well, it's essentially just one big random variables that are related to each other, each one can be calculated only from the previous one, so this is some sort of a Markov chain. So we know a lot about Markov chains, but one of the things that is really interesting in deep learning, in this very simple, without feedback and everything else, feedforward machines, is that I can characterize this network by two stochastic maps, which I call the encoder of the layer, how is the layer depend on the input, and the decoder of the layer, how the output, the label depends on the layer. Now, my, my striking statement, which I stand behind even after many, many criticisms during this year by many people, is that only two numbers per layer which are really important. So essentially, out of those million parameters, million synaptic connections, only two numbers tell you the story if the network is going to be successful, is it going to do the job. Essentially, it's telling me the story of the trade-off between number of size of data or number of examples I need and accuracy. And these two numbers, I'm not going to define them today, are the mutual information, or the, the, which is a well-defined function of the joint distribution of these variables between the input and the layer, which are called the input or the, the encoder information, and the output and the layer, which is the decoder information. Now, this is a very striking thing which not, nobody believes. I actually argue that this is true when the problems become very large. And what is really important about being very large, I mean, the problems that we're talking about now grew by three or four orders of magnitude in the last 30 years. So in the 80s, we were looking about hundreds of pixels in an image, and now we're looking at millions of pixels in an image. And this brings everything to entirely a different realm, which is very familiar to physicists, it's called statistical mechanics, or it's very familiar to information theorists. Both of them talk about typical large problems. 
And the information, these two values of information essentially dominate the problem. And I, I don't have too much time, but I'm going to show you this movie, which I showed many, many times, but it's always striking. What you see here is in this plan of information about the output, information about the input, how the layers behave when we train them with back propagation, with stochastic gradient descent, which is a very stupid algorithm, by the way. <laughs> so essentially, what, the, what you see here, the first strike, you see 100 different networks, completely different. They're initialized differently. They have the same architecture and the same data, but the examples are different. The order of the example is different, and the weights are different. And they look very, very similar along the training in this plan. Actually, the last hidden layer, this, uh, this uh, orange uh, cloud, is, is really, of course, by, due to something called data processing inequality, is, of course, always lower than the previous layers, which are to the right here. But uh, it's very concentrated. So just the fact that I see it as a concentration of measure of these two variables already telling us something quite striking. The details don't matter. It's only these two numbers out of millions which really tell you the story. And eventually you see that there are actually two phases here. In the first phase, I first fit the data very quickly within something like 300 epochs of training, which is cycled through the data. And then in the rest 10,000 epochs, I essentially push the information about the label higher and to the left of all the layers. I mean, this, is, this, was a quanti quant this is, can be very nicely drawn by average in this cloud. So you see these very nice traces. From A to C, I'm memorizing the data. And from C to E, I compress the representation, which means I forget information about the input. And how it's done, I'll tell you in a second. And through this, I actually improve my generalization, which means I predict the label much better. So this is surprising. It was a surprise for a lot of us, including us, a lot of people, including us. Uh, essentially, most of the epochs of deep learning training are spent on cycling the data where the training error is already very low. And we all know that. And I can show you directly in all sorts of simulations. The, error, the training error essentially saturates, and we keep on training, crunching these numbers, and we improve generalization. And we improve generalization because something very funny happens to the layers. They climb up in this plan and eventually get to the point where they remember or the last hidden layer or the last layer, remember exactly only the one bit from the input that I need in order to make the prediction. Now, now there are many questions when you see this problem. And of course, the nice thing about it is that we have some sort of a theory, and these are Noga and Havid, of course, which essentially amount to something which I call the information bottleneck idea, or the information bottleneck principle, essentially telling us, look, the networks, layer by layer, somehow try to compress the representation as much as possible. They don't do it consciously. There's no consciousness anywhere in this picture. They simply do it because of the noise in the gradient descent. And, and this, of course, there are many arguments about it, why it happens when I have less data, this compression phase, is much less effective, and I have more data to the right here, I actually compressing the representation and improve the generalization. And we actually have a rigorous bound that tells us that any bit of compression of the representation, which is forgetting of information about the input, is equivalent to doubling the size of the data. So it's exponentially more powerful than any dimension that you can imagine. It's not expressivity, it's not what type of functions can be implemented, it's how well I can compress or forget the irrelevant details of the problem. Let me give you an example. I mean, let's say that I want to recognize a cat. So, uh, of course, there are many, many details on the face of this cat which are really irrelevant for the fact that it's a cat. I mean, the, the exact distribution of the colors, the exact colors, and the exact... Actually, I want something like a caricature of the cat. Actually, a very, very simple description that really captures the essence of a cat, whatever that is nose, the, the ears, the tail, whatever you want. Now, in terms of bits, the amount of bits required to describe the picture, the, the full image, and the amount of bits required to describe the caricature is three or four orders of magnitude smaller. And I can compress it dramatically. And this compression is essentially telling me, look, ignore the details. How has it happened? So surprisingly, we are using this very funny algorithm known as stochastic gradient descent, which essentially calculates the gradient of small pieces of the data instead of all the whole data. So there are going to be fluctuations in the gradient from image to image, 
which essentially amount to noise, and this we can actually prove and rigorously and prove and, and so see numerically, during the first part of training, about the three first 300 epochs, the gradient is very clear, and the signal-to-noise ratio of the gradient is very high, and this is amount to this very fast drift, which happens very quickly. 300 epochs is very quickly. Yeah? And then through the next 9,000 epochs, the noise, actually the standard deviation of the gradients, is a lot higher than the mean. This is a log-log scale, which means that in the second phase, I'm doing essentially diffusion. I'm doing random walks in these weights. And surprisingly, we actually know how to prove that this random walk is pushing us to a theoretical limit, this black line, which we know how to calculate only from the problem. It doesn't depend on the algorithm. It doesn't depend on the problem. It doesn't depend on the architecture. It's a function of the problem, the joint distribution only. So I'm essentially doing a very dramatic shift to learning theory. Instead of thinking about what we call distribution independent worst case bounds, I'm thinking about data dependent but algorithm independent bound. And this, of course, if it holds for any algorithm, it also holds for our brain or for the brain of any alien, which I can't even imagine. This is the best anyone can do. This is information theoretic bound. And my argument is that eventually the layers of the network converge through this noise in the gradient very slowly in this diffusion process that you saw to the optimal to information theoretic bound. In that sense, these machines, if it happens, if it can happen, if they are expressive enough, and so on, and uh, these machines are optimal. And the only interesting question is how fast does it happen? And here is really one of the striking results of this theory. If you train on the same problem with one hidden layer, two hidden layers, and so on, up to six hidden layers, you see something quite dramatic. The number of time iterations or cycles through the data that I need to do with six hidden layers is dramatically smaller than the one the that I need to do with one hidden layer, although one hidden layer can fit the data. It just takes forever. So the benefit of the hidden layer is computational. It's in the dynamics of the training. Now, I want to go back to the perception action cycle. How much to Okay. So uh, why is this interesting for our brain? Why does it tell us anything about us? So first of all, we now have direct existence of machines which are, seem to be quite good. I mean, they do face recognition probably better than most of us. They do voice recognition and speech recognition very well as well. They start to do other things like driving cars and what other, whatever you're going to hear next. So uh, these are intelligent machines, and I don't care if they have consciousness or what are their phi function. Where is Christopher? So, uh, I really don't care. They behave very well. For any naive answer to the question, are they intelligent? Yes, they are intelligent. They don't only win chess. This is one architecture which is good in a vast number of very different tasks with just minute tweaking of the parameters in training. So I argue that our brain is doing something very similar. Okay. And essentially, I take this perception action cycle very, very seriously and model a lot of phenomena with it. But I really want to go to our main question, the phase conditions. What make us human? Now, OK, so I, 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 I take deep learning as an example, a very concrete example, a very clear example. I think we begin to understand pretty well that the details don't matter. All these different networks that you saw in exactly the same point in the information plane have ex the very different parameters, very different activities of neurons, very different synapses. It's the information in the whole process, in the whole layer, which seems to do the trick. So there's no uniqueness, there's no identifiability. There are many different brains that work just as well. Now, the question is whether we need to know every synapse. I argue that it's hopeless anyway, but we don't need to. But where was the phase transitions that made us human, made us so different? So again, I want to look at, at our ability to make predictions. So. We, I think it's very intuitive to all of you, and we can actually argue rigorously, that the information about the future is diluted in time. We know more about the immediate future. I know much more about the next hour than I know about the next day, and certainly much I know less about, I know more or less about the same as I know about the next day, as I know about the next week, or the next month, or the next year, and so on. Information is curved. This is what we call predictive information. 
I mean, how much I actually know about the future is getting diluted with time. So it's highly nonlinear. Now, there was one magical step in our evolution, and I'm willing to stand behind it anywhere, that made us move from this linear time, which thinks about units of time in the same way, to think about nonlinear time, which is actually scaled by the information that we actually have about the future. So in order to do this, in order to make long-term planning, we needed something quite dramatic, which is some sort of recursion. We need to invent new terms to describe longer and longer periods. This is something which is related to renormalization group, which I don't want to get into. But I actually argue that our language, through its recursive ability, through the ability to scale time, so we have different terms for weeks and months and years, and this special change suddenly increased our horizon of planning and memory from being very short of the order of days to being essentially infinite. So there's something in the ability to rescale time and think about week in the same way to think about a year or about 10 years or about the age of the universe. I have absolutely no problem thinking about the Big Bang and the, di the death of the universe. This is what makes us human. The ability to think about very far past and very past far future, and it doesn't relate to the ability to produce voice or to speak in the... Or, 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 sign language is just as good or even richer than voice, and it doesn't depend on the size of our eyebrow. It, it depends on our ability to renormalize time or to think about very, very long times in the same ease that we think about very short times. And as far as I know, there's no other animal that can do this. And we actually have the mathematics that tell us that if you expand time, this is in the lower part of this graph, our future becomes much simpler. We actually not, don't need to be that complex in order to make very long plans. And this is actually an idea that I've been pursuing with many students, both in terms of understanding art, for example, why do we enjoy art, I, I don't have time, or recently with Nogol Zaslavsky, how language color names is evolved, and so on and so forth. So, so I want to finish just by trying to summarize. So what makes us human according to me, with all the humility needed? So it's not the specific microbiological details. They're obviously not essential. Here is a machine which has no cell, it has only mathematical connections, and they do very well. Whether it depends on higher consciousness, well, I don't know. Consciousness is one of those things which is especially self-referential. I can talk about my consciousness, I can hardly talk about other consciousness. So this has probably a logical flaw that has so any logical circular argument has. I don't believe that consciousness is a very well-defined thing. It's actually a very ill-defined thing. And I don't believe that the integrated information, for example, is either sufficient or necessary for intelligent behavior. At least I, don't, I didn't see any argument for that. So what is it? So I really say again, it's exploiting long past memory for long valuable futures. The fact that we were able somehow to extend our ideas and perception of time beyond the very immediate sensation to the very, as far as in principle we want, and this has to do with this recursive structure of the language. And of course, what really makes us human, why it happens so soon? I mean, only 10,000 years, years ago, maybe 20,000 years ago, we were essentially just, uh, you know, walking chimpanzees. <laughs> maybe a little, maybe 100,000 years ago. But, you know, the biology haven't changed so much. So it obviously has to do with the ability not only to think about the future, but the ability, first of all, to ignore the irrelevant, because if you couldn't ignore the irrelevant, our mind would, would blow. We don't have enough memory for remembering every detail. So it's all about compressing of the details, very much like what I believe happens in deep learning. And it's the ability to transfer valuable information across generation, which is, you know, language and writing and other things which really evolved very recently. And that's, in my view, what makes us human. Thank you very much. We spoke about time, but still, <laughs> but still, anybody wants to ask one or two questions, then we shall have a discussion. M Misha. Uh, you said deep, deep networks are intelligent, but what you actually showed is that they become an expert in one particular 
task, like, like one bit machine, right? whether it's me or not me, or whether it's a cat or not cat. And we know in real life people who are as specialized and as expert in the problem that somebody else posed for them, they're not considered to be intelligent. Right? The intelligent people are the people who can invent interesting problems, not necessarily to solve them. All right. So and I, 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 I think I see, I've said like, the how do you square all this you know, contradiction? So first of all, uh, of course, I didn't have time for that. But uh, I actually know that those different layers are become more and more experts only at the end. And actually, the lower layers capture a lot more information than the higher layers about many different tasks. For example, you could train a network to do car recognition and then train only the, of, uh, only the last layers to do face recognition. Essentially, it's a very small change uh, because all the environments are very similar and so on. So, yes, there are many layers which can come the, at the end, but the end is very small. So we have enough uh, neurons in our brain to have this common uh, f forward basis layer, the beginning of the Eiffel Tower, and then split. So I don't see any contradiction here. And actually, uh, there is a lot of work on, on transfer learning and about learning more than one task and so on and so forth. I mean, when I learn to recognize faces, I don't recognize one face. I, I usually recognize a family of faces, so, and I do all sorts of refinements later on. But this is, these are details. I don't believe that this is the issue. And it's the same architecture. Unlike the chess playing machine that with Kasparov, in, which was really a very special purpose machine with highly non-intelligence and anything here, else deep learning seems to be quite universal and quite general. And, be, and this is really one of the miracles, one of the secrets why how it happens. And I argue that I have a, at least the beginning of some understanding of this. Yeah, I think we are out of time. Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll have time to discuss it later. <laughs>